by Kerman's Law, Year 2, Day 72. In its databanks, the craft we found on Ike is called the Flying Saucer, and was able to drill for ore and refuel much faster than the pod Aerochelle and I landed in. It had enough Delta V to get into orbit around Ike and transfer to Duna. Unlike the pod, it had both a huge heat shield and parachutes, so the Duna people had no reason not to give us clearance. It seems strange that we would just happen to find a ticket to land on Duna here on Ike, but we couldn't pass it up. Aerochelle confirmed that the landing gear on it were broken, but everything else was fine, at least we thought was fine, and touching down on the large heat shield seemed safe enough. Aerochelle did final checks on the pod and sealed it up, leaving a signal to indicate that we were temporarily away so people wouldn't try to salvage it the way we were doing with the flying saucer. The flying saucer could make Duna orbit if it's fully loaded, but I hope to sell it on Duna, or return it to its rightful owner for a reward, and then get a shuttle back to Ike to reclaim the pod. The pod had a manufacturer's warranty and everything, after all. So he took off from Ike, and with 16 engines, even with a full fuel payload, this flying saucer had a lot of thrust. I had to be very careful with the throttle not to overdo it. We were ready to set her back down if there was any instability or any problem, but it was all quite smooth and so we were pretty confident we could get the flying saucer over to Duna orbit. Whether it would make the descent and landing safely, well, that was the adventure. At least that was supposed to be the adventure. Uh, things would turn out a little bit differently and get a lot more adventurous than we could have imagined. But we made Ike orbit just fine, and flying for Duna was no problem. It only takes about a little over 100 meters per second to transfer from Ike to Duna and a lot of remarkable views with this thing because the cupola is right on top and so you can just point in the prograde vector, the engines are pointed the right way and you can see what's ahead of you completely clearly. Unfortunately, Aero Shell couldn't be in the, in the cupola with me, it only has one seat. Uh, she had to be in the lander can, but uh, she didn't mind. Um, I decided that we would switch places along the way. It was interesting that the heat shield only had one-tenth of its ablator remaining, and I wondered what happened to all that ablator. That was a lot of ablator, I mean it's a huge heat shield, and just the amount that we had left would be more than enough to deal with Duna's atmosphere. But what could have possibly uh, gotten rid of so much ablator out here? I had no idea. I also wondered why it had lost its landing legs. I guess maybe it was too heavy for them? But that would be a really easy thing to fix on design. You wouldn't have to crash on Ike to figure that out. Now the good people on Duna's surface might have given a second thought to giving us clearance if we had told them about the landing gear. So we didn't. It wasn't very easy to scan for. Uh, they could see the heat shield and the parachutes from our database. But there wasn't any information about the whether the landing gear was intact. Inside the cockpit, I can tell that the sun is a lot smaller here around Duna than it is around Kerbin. But that's because our windows have anti-glare shielding and to protect our eyes and all. So it doesn't have the same effect. But I think standing on Duna's surface, I don't know if it'd be so easy to tell. Uh, it was our goal to find out. The plan was to make an orbiter of Duna first. Uh, we would pass our periapsis and then head out to apoapsis, drop our periapsis down into Duna's atmosphere, and then land. I decided to double check whether I could retract the extending arms that have the engines that were supposed to have the landing gear and have the ore mining drills. And those retracted just fine so everything could be protected by the heat shield. Otherwise, uh, there was a chance that the engines might might get overheated, but I doubt it with Duna's atmosphere would probably have been safe anyway. So we were just uh, approaching periapsis on our way to apoapsis and everything looked fine for a uh, Duna landing when, well, we weren't around Duna anymore, suddenly. Uh, I found myself uh, dropping, uh, our speed was going down, our radar altitude was going down, and we're headed towards the surface of, of an unknown planet. Definitely not Duna. Definitely not a red planet. Uh, more yellow. A lot more yellow. And there were features on the ground. Things that looked like cities. Definitely mountains. But I couldn't really get a good view of things from the cupola because it was pointed straight up. It was actually Aerochelle with her window and the lander can 
who could see a little bit more than I could, but not much. Fortunately, the atmosphere seemed really thick, so we were slowing down pretty well. And of course, the big heat shield helped a lot of drag there, and so we weren't descending too quickly. I told the autopilot to hold negative surface velocity so that our drag could slow us down even better, and we started to rotate. It wasn't too bad though, so I wasn't worried. Aeroshell reported that this had to be a big planet because there wasn't any obvious curvature to it when she looked at the horizon. So that was interesting. Our internal systems recognized it as something called Earth, but I have no idea how it could know that. But I guess that has to do with where this came from originally. Maybe the flying saucer came from this planet, but I have no idea what kind of technology could bring it back here so quickly. Definitely nothing us Kerbals have. I extended the engine pods to get ready for landing. It wouldn't take much Delta V to slow down, uh, since the atmosphere was already doing most of the work. But we did have that rotation, and the off pile was having trouble holding our orientation, even though the engines definitely had gimbling to them. It was a good thing that we didn't enter this planet's atmosphere higher up, because with the thickness of the atmosphere and how big the planet is, uh, we would be likely traveling very quickly, and I don't know if the 10% of remaining ablator on the heat shield would have been enough to protect us. But as it was, we were in the middle of the atmosphere, uh, on the lower end of it, and not traveling very fast. The problem was uh, landing safely, uh, with everything going uh, topply. Yeah, uh, I didn't do such a good job of that. There was some imbalance in the craft that wasn't present around Ike and Duna. I don't know why it decided to wobble. Maybe it was just because of the atmosphere. Maybe there were winds or something. We weren't traveling very fast. And I guess the aerodynamics of this craft weren't exactly great. We ended up upside down. I retracted the engine pods just for safety because we didn't want them blowing up. And then I decided it was time to try and get out. Our internal scans showed that the atmosphere was compatible and that we wouldn't need our helmets, but having landed upside down is a little bit painful to get out of the cupola. The sight that awaited me in Aeroshell was forbidding. Uh, it didn't look like this was a hospitable or habitable planet. There wasn't anything visible growing around. But Aeroshell had seen structures. She said she saw something that looked like cities. Organization of some kind. So maybe there was hope. Maybe there was just a desert in an otherwise populated world with, with food. After all the excitement, I really needed a snack. We'll have to see. Anyway, this is Buck Kerman, signing off.